It ended up, according to the indictment, involving about 80 employees of the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg. So they were, you know, working on shifts, trying to sort of imitate U.S. time zones to lend a little more credence to their operations. So they were sort of posting away on Facebook, creating these pages, firing away on Twitter, quite a big operation on Instagram. So they were working away. You know, to me, it had an entrepreneurial feel. You know, these people were given general instructions and guidelines and the, the messages they wanted to convey. And then they were given, you know, a bit of leeway, and they could use imagination. And there, there's a little bit of a sense of throwing stuff up against the wall and seeing what stuck. Right. It, it included, we are told, establishing hundreds of uh, email, PayPal, and bank accounts, inclu and including the, the theft of some, the identities of some Americans. Why would they need to do that? I mean, anybody can, you know, sign up for a Twitter or Facebook account pretty quickly, right? Yes, but they paid for ads in some cases. And they also, uh, you know, it, it appears they wanted to sometimes borrow people's identities just to lend a little more credibility to their operation. Ultimately, you know, this really became a pretty large-scale operation. Facebook estimated that the Russian material, which is basically these pages, if people haven't seen them, they, they have these memes, these sort of poster-like images with a, with a slogan, usually. And those were you know, followed by hundreds of thousands of Americans, and so that they would start seeing the, the messages in their Facebook feed. So Facebook estimated that over two years, about 126 million Americans, you know, had this stuff in their feeds. And, you know, how many Americans actually saw the material and focused on it is impossible to say, but that's half of the U.S. adult population, so by then it was a pretty big operation. Wow. They sought to connect with actual American political operatives and activists, Trump supporters and others. You want to give us some examples of how they tried to do that and how successful they were? Sure. The, you know, this is, this is where it, it gets both even more impressive and, and kind of creepy. But they were using uh, direct message on Twitter, Facebook messages and other means to reach out to real American activists. So uh, these pages were anti-immigrant pages. They were you know, so, sort of taking volatile stances on race. They were, generally speaking, um, vociferously anti-Hillary Clinton, often pro-Donald Trump. So they could reach out to activists in all of these fields and try to say, hey, you know, we're, we're part of your cause. And in many cases, they started calling people to rallies. So it's, you know, it's hard to even get your mind around this, but these are people, Russian citizens, sitting in St. Petersburg, 4,000, 5,000 miles away, calling people to rallies, saying, you know, be at such and such a place at 1 p.m. on Saturday for a rally on, on so-and-so. And in many cases, people actually showed up. That, you know, Facebook has, has sort of gradually become a little more transparent about this. It took them a long time to acknowledge any of this had happened. But they have said that 13 of these Russian Facebook pages called a total of 129 rallies that about 338,000 different Facebook users viewed these events, the, the calls to these events, and about 62,000 Americans at least said on Facebook that they planned to go to one of these events. So you have people, Americans, being manipulated from thousands of miles away by people who they assume to be fellow activists but are actually these Russian trolls. You know, it's interesting. I cover state and local politics here in Philadelphia, and I remember in October of 2016, in the heat of the presidential campaign, seeing a notice in my email of a Miners for Trump rally in South Philadelphia. South Philadelphia, is, as you know, <laughs> is nowhere near coal country. And I just thought this was odd. And with all the other things to do, I didn't go. But now it turns out this appears to have been promoted by something called Being Patriotic, which I guess was one of the Russian-inspired fronts. And on, there's a Facebook post of theirs that, that reads, 
America has always been hinged on hard-working people. The state of Pennsylvania rose owing to multiple companies mining coal, producing steel, and creating the need for other jobs, groceries, doctors, dentists, insurance, gas vehicles, etc. That's closer than I could get to vernacular in, in any foreign language, but it's a little <laughs> off. I think a little off, exactly. And that's, that's sort of classic. Sometimes they hit the target. Sometimes you see their stuff and you say, huh, a little bit off. I, I remember seeing one that spelled nationalist with an E instead of an A, nationalist, mm -hmm. which is actually sort of the Russian, you know, if you're pronouncing English with a Russian pronunciation, it's more nationalist. In Baltimore, where I live, there was a pastor who was also a big activist named the Reverend Heber Brown III, and he saw a group on Facebook called Blacktivist, calling a rally, a demonstration, to mark the first anniversary of the death of Freddie Gray, who some listeners may remember was a black man in Baltimore who died after being injured in police custody. And Heber Brown went on direct message on Twitter to contact this group, Blacktivist, and said, you guys don't even seem to live in Baltimore. How appropriate is it to call a rally when you're not even here and you know but he still assumed they were Americans and they answered in that same kind of English that you were just citing they said we are looking for friendship because we are fighting for the same reasons actually we are open for your thoughts and offers so so again you you know he was a little perplexed by this told them to you know back off and stop meddling in other cities affairs but, you know, only found out months later that these guys were, were in another city that was far, far away. So, so it doesn't seem there's a lot of evidence of them generating mass events, uh, although clearly there are some people who responded to some of their appeals in some way. But it's harder to estimate how much these efforts might have influenced the thinking, opinions, and votes of Americans. There were some pretty colorful ads. You want to describe one or two? Yeah, I mean, one had sort of a debate between Jesus and Satan in which uh, Satan was promoting Hillary Clinton. There was... Uh, Satan actually has horns, right? And he's yes, arm, yes. arm wrestling Jesus. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, something that has occurred to me, especially as, as I got back into this in recent days after the indictment, there must have been some fun and joy involved on the Russians' part just getting into creating these images, fooling people, you know, sort of insinuating themselves into these divisive American debates. You know, it seems to have been quite a, a vigorous and maybe for them a, a kind of enjoyable effort. Scott Shane covers national security and intelligence issues at the New York Times Washington Bureau. We'll continue our conversation in just a moment about Russian efforts to influence American politics and the charges coming from the Mueller investigation. Apart from promoting Donald Trump and attacking Hillary Clinton once the general election campaign was underway, there were other more subtle efforts, right, like depressing black votes. That's right. I mean, one thing that you see is that these Russian trolls promoted not only Donald Trump, but also Bernie Sanders and Jill Stein. And the Sanders' efforts seemed to be when Senator Sanders, you know, had given up his campaign and endorsed Hillary Clinton, these Russian efforts kind of went into overdrive to tell Sanders' supporters, don't betray the cause, don't go with Hillary Clinton, stay home, don't vote. And similarly, there was some Russian messaging that was mentioned in the indictment addressing Jill Stein supporters, the Green Party candidate, saying, vote for Stein, your vote will not be wasted. And some of these efforts were directed at the black community. There were also these Russian trolls took advantage of, you know, I think, I think it's fair to say existing currents in the black community during the campaign, where folks had gone back and taken a harder look at Bill Clinton's record at the beginnings of mass incarceration and sort of zero tolerance policies against crime and uh, Hillary Clinton's infamous 
labeling of some criminals as super predators and the Russians played up that as well to try to apparently depress uh, black turnout for Clinton. You, you know this may, might be a, a point to talk about how we regulate our in political speech. I mean, you know there, there are rules about political advertising in this country, right? If you're affecting a campaign you have to disclose who you are, the name of your organization, and you have to file reports disclosing your donations and expenses. Uh, so-called news reports, I guess, aren't subject to those same rules, right? Because they're not paid advertising. They're theoretically, you know, journalism or some kind of nonfiction. What obligation do social media sites have to regulate something like this? Well, I think it's fair to say that the social media companies have been extremely wary of regulation because their business model has been based on user growth getting millions and then billions of people to use their sites and then directing advertising at them. So, you know, they've worked very hard to avoid regulation. But now there are some proposals to begin to regulate social media political advertising the same way, you know, say, political ads on TV are regulated. Everyone remembers the kind of, you know, I'm Donald Trump and I approve this message, the notion that you have to have somebody to take responsibility for a particular ad, you know where it's coming from. Of course, that is imperfect too. On TV you see these ads for paid for by citizens for a better America, and you have no idea who that really is. But there's some, there's some accountability there at least, and, and there, is, there are efforts in Congress now to perhaps apply that to the social media world. But I should say that there's been a little bit of misunderstanding out there about how the Russians operated. You know, there have been a lot of reports that they only spent $100,000 on Facebook ads, and only about half of that was before the election. And that's true, but the vast majority of the exposure of the Russian material was not in the form of paid ads. The paid ads were, were really a small effort. It was more this, uh, you know, what Facebook calls these, this organic spread of material from the Facebook pages, stuff that, that the Russians didn't have to pay for, that people were liking and uh, sharing with their friends, and that was making its way through Facebook organically as opposed to being paid for. Facebook estimated that these Russian efforts reached roughly 126 million Americans which is a huge, huge number. We don't know how many of them took them seriously or acted upon them. Um, I, I'm just wondering, do we have any context for that number? Do we know how it would compare to a, a Coke marketing campaign or, or, or some other big effort to influence public opinion? Well, you know, Facebook has emphasized that even that huge number, half the adult population in the United States, is small by Facebook standards. The amount of information that's out there on Facebook, and he looked up at it, people, that was only one out of 23,000 pieces of content placed in people's news feeds on Facebook during this period. So it's a tiny percentage of everything on Facebook, but of course at the same time it's a whole lot of stuff. They put up 80,000 posts over two years, the Russians did, and a lot of it was shared quite a bit, and you know, we should, we're, we've been kind of picking on Facebook here. On Google, you know, the Russians created 18 channels, put up more than a thousand videos, totaling 43 hours. Twitter identified, and in a, I'm quite sure this is incomplete, but they identified more than 50,000 automated accounts, these so-called bot accounts on Twitter, that were linked to the, the Russian uh, campaign. So they were sort of firing on, on all cylinders during this period. Uh, we, we should talk about the president's reaction to all this. Um, one thing he said is that the American election was not impacted by the Russian activities. Um, the, the Mueller indictment made no such claim, right? And no one can know for sure. Exactly, yeah. But I mean, the president has always reacted to news about the Russian attack on the election in terms of what it means for him. And so he immediately took to Twitter to essentially say, initially case closed, um, no, you know, because the, the Mueller indictment and Rod Rosenstein, the Deputy Attorney General, when he in, announced it said, no American appeared to, you know, you know ha had wittingly cooperated with this operation, was 
was named in the indictment as wittingly cooperating with this, knowingly cooperating. So, you know, the president took that opportunity to say, you know, I'm off the hook. Uh, yeah, good news. My colleagues who cover the White House said that his attitude evolved uh, over the weekend and become so, became so much darker because he realized this was not be, being taken as a sort of clean bill of health, but in fact, proof that there had been crimes committed during the Russian operation. You know, there were, were violations of uh, American law and also that this was, uh, you know, a very significant effect. It was not a hoax. It was something very specific that was carried out by a large team in Russia. So the president at times has said, Russia hoax. And this does seem to say, whatever this was, it wasn't just a hoax. You know, President Trump said, you know, this clears me, it shows there's no collusion. It didn't really do that. And he said it shows there was no effect. And the, the indictments don't do that. Now, one thing the president hasn't done is to comment on the seriousness of this effort to undermine American democracy. What's the impact of his lack of attention to that part of it? Well, I think it concerns a lot of people in Congress and across the government and across the country because, uh, you know, intelligence officials told Congress last week that there are already signs that the Russians are thinking about the midterms and are likely to intervene in various ways in the midterm elections held later this year. You know, primaries are, are, are coming up in, in many states, you know, in the, in the near future. And so there's been a lot of unhappiness that the president has not shown, shown sort of leadership in terms of saying, you know, you know, Russia intervened in our election, in our democratic process, and we are going to use all the forces of the government, all the resources of the government, to make sure they don't do it again. He hasn't focused on that. He hasn't said that. And that has distressed a lot of people inside and outside the government. You know, one reason I like to read indictments is that they often provide clues to how investigators learned what they know. What does this indictment tell us about how the FBI figured this out? Well, there are some clues and some interesting ones. Uh, among other things, the indictment quotes from emails. Uh, for example, an email that a woman working for the Russian troll operation St. Petersburg sent to her family saying, uh, you know, actually last year, saying, geez, the, you know, so, sorry, I've been busy. Um, we're really scrambling to cover our tracks because the FBI has busted us. You know, the FBI is on to us. Now, how did the FBI get a hold of an email that a woman in St. Petersburg sent to her family? Um, you know, one would have to assume that the National Security Agency might have been uh, targeting some of these folks and picking up their emails. Uh, so there seems to have been, you know, signals intelligence, intercept, intercepted communications involved. And another possible clue is that three people are being described, are, are describing the indictment, Russians, as having visited the United States on sort of intelligence missions in advance of this operation in 2014. And two of them are named, but one is not named. Now, there doesn't seem to be any reason to treat that person differently unless that person is cooperating with the investigation, in which case their name, you know, would be left out of it. So that does raise the possibility that there's an insider from the Russian operation who's cooperating with Mr. Mueller. The other thing that's interesting about that is from the description of the person who visited Atlanta in November of 2014, and who's not named, his colleagues, his bosses in Russia could certainly identify him. And the fact that, that he, uh, you know, that they did put that information in the indictment could potentially endanger that person. So it makes you wonder whether not only is he cooperating, but is he perhaps in the United States now? I gather nobody expects the Russians charged in this investigation to be, you know, brought to justice. Why do you think Mueller uh, unveiled this indictment, made these accusations public? That's right. I mean, I don't think, you know, about the, the biggest effect of this is likely to prevent these Russians from traveling 
uh, without uh, fear that they might be you know, arrested, not only in the United States, but in other parts of Europe and so on, uh, on an arrest warrant from the US. Uh, one of the bosses from this troll factory in St. Petersburg actually said in an interview after the indictments, Russia is a big country with a lot of beautiful places, and uh, so he's going to limit his travel to Russia. But uh, so, so you know, I think one answer to why Mueller, uh, you know, indicted these Russians, you know, knowing that they probably would not be punished, is that that's you know that's what he was asked to do. He was assigned to investigate and carry out a criminal investigation of the Russian interference in the election and any possible, you know, cooperation collusion from uh, President Trump or his associates, and that's what he's doing. And this is sort of so he found that these Russians had violated American law, so he indicted them. But one former government official told me that he thought this was a message indictment, and that he thought that one reason Mueller did it was to settle once and for all the question of whether the, the notion of Russian interference in the US election was or was not a hoax, as the president has said, by you know indicting uh, three companies and 13 Russian individuals you know, he, he certainly sent the message that this was not a hoax. And, uh, and also, perhaps, uh, the same official thought, putting some Americans you know, on notice that if they had had any communications with these Russians or other Russians as part of the election campaign, that basically, you know, Mueller was going to come after them. And it might encourage some of those people to come forward and offer what they knew in hopes of ultimately avoiding punishment or, or mitigating punishment. The attention in the Mueller probe focused on the effect of the elections. Are, are these networks still active? What are they doing now? Yeah, it's, you know, certainly the experts who follow this stuff closely, while it's impossible to be absolutely certain what's Russian and what's not, they say that these Russian trolls, who are believed to be government-sponsored, are still very active, and their continuing activity appears to be in dividing, you know, Americans. And so every time there's a divisive issue, a school shooting, the controversy over, you know, NFL players kneeling to protest against police shootings, anything that's sort of a hot topic that uh, on which Americans have strongly divided feelings, you find these suspected Russian Twitter accounts especially pumping it out at very high volume. And so it appears that the Russians have not abandoned the idea of doing their part to divide America, not that we're not pretty well divided on our own. And the motive here is that Vladimir Putin does not want the United States to be a model for his own country. In 2011, there were big demonstrations in Moscow and other cities against Putin, and essentially f in favor of democracy. And he, you know, to the degree that he can help mar the image of the United States, make the U.S. look like a chaotic and gridlocked and divided place, a very troubled country, neither Russians nor their neighbors are going to say, hey, geez, let's create a society like the United States. Well, Scott Chain, uh, thanks so much for speaking with us again. Thanks, Dave. I think we're having trouble hearing you, so just one moment. Yeah, we're, uh, we're having trouble with our microphone right now. Um, if, you can, if you can go over to this microphone just over here, I'm so sorry. <laughs> here we go. Live radio in the studio. Here. Do we have you? Do we have you now? Yes. Okay. So, what is Cambridge Analytica? So, Cambridge Analytica is um, a firm founded by Robert Mercer, who is the kind of billionaire hedge fund uh, conservative donor Steve Bannon, his and Mercer's daughter Rebecca. And their conceit was that we're going to use big data to map the personality of every voter, and through this kind of personality assessment, be able to predict their behavior and be able to message that message of them, like figure out who's neurotic and fearful who's open-minded, who loves the occult, and, and we'll be able to kind of reshape American culture and reshape American political culture with this really powerful new data science. Uh, you call uh, what happened a huge data breach. Can you explain? Look, can, uh, they, they 
Cambridge Analytica was able to harvest using a Cambridge um, using a Cambridge, Cambridge University academic, they were able to harvest about 50 million profiles uh, off Facebook. That information was supposedly for academic use only. It ended up in a private data firm run by a conservative billionaire. So basically a bunch of data went from one place it was supposed to be to another place it wasn't without the consent of the people who put it there. Uh, all right, you and other news organizations got a lot of this new information from a leaker. Uh, his name is Chris Wiley. He helped found Cambridge Analytica. Uh, the UK's Channel 4 interviewed him and he says what Cambridge Analytica did was basically weaponize your Facebook page. Let's listen. So whenever you go and you like something, you are giving me a clue as to who you are as a person. And so all of this can be captured very easily and run through an algorithm that learns who you are. When you go to work, right, your coworkers only see one side of you. Your friends only see one side of you. But a computer sees all kinds of sides of you. And so we can get better than human-level accuracy at predicting your behavior. So, so how did this group actually use this information on American voters? They were building psychographic profiles. You know, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is a new field, both in academia and in, in marketing and messaging, and that uh, Chris is a true believer in it. Um, there were a lot of people who said this didn't work as well. Um, that this was an early iteration and they hadn't quite nailed it. But the basic idea is supposedly is that idea that we can figure out who you are as a person and then we can tailor messages that will scare you or inspire you. And that we can do this largely through your Facebook likes. If you have like 50 Facebook likes, we got you. We got you. It, it's remarkably simple and I think, you know, there is, there is that fear right now that people are putting information online and it will be used in ways they don't understand to try and manipulate them. And that is, in essence, what they wanted to do. Uh, and of course, um, Cambridge Analytica, as you mentioned, was involved in helping President Donald Trump get elected. Uh, I want to play a little bit more of Wiley speaking to Channel 4 about how specifically Steve Bannon, who was Trump's uh, chief, chief strategist, wanted to use this technology. Steve wanted weapons for his culture war. That's what he wanted. We offered him a way to accomplish what he wanted to do, which was change the culture of America. Uh, change the culture of America, that seems like a big remit. Uh, did it change people's minds? Is there any evidence you say that we really don't know? It, 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 it's not conclusive. Um, you know, there were a lot of people around the Trump campaign who said they didn't do that much, and what they did wasn't that great. Uh, it's, it's Cambridge Analytica's track record is, is very uncertain and whether it will have any major clients in the coming election cycles is really, really deeply uncertain right now. Uh, you know, I, I think everybody has to remember this is a really, really young field, and that if this is gonna develop, and it may, um, it's gonna be a little while. Uh, how does what you uncovered link to Robert Mueller's investigation into election interference? So we know that, that Mueller has, has asked Cambridge Analytica for all the documents and emails related to its work on the Trump campaign. Um, what exactly they're investigating is hard to say. Uh, you know, the Mueller investigation is this black box. Mm. Uh, they, don't, they don't talk. You know, in, in our work, we also found a number of kind of odd, almost unexplained connections to Russia. They, they Luke Oil, which is a, a Russian oil company that's pretty tight with, with some of Putin's inner circle, they kind of showed up in the summer of 2014 and were like, hey, we want to talk to you about American voter data, um, which is odd. Because, because they're in oil company. So and why would they be interested in that? They have like one, two gas stations in the U.S. and there's one in Georgetown, actually. Um, so it was kind of strange what they wanted out of, out of the U.S. And, and so, you know, where Mueller's going with this, we don't know. Matthew Rosenberg from the New York Times, thank you so very much. Thank you. Representatives from Facebook are due to brief American congressional aides later today in Washington as politicians there and in Europe demand answers about the alleged misuse of personal data belonging to millions of users. It's claimed a British firm, Cambridge Analytica, used the data to try to influence the 2016 US presidential election. Both Cambridge Analytica and Facebook deny any wrongdoing. Facebook held a staff meeting at its headquarters in San Francisco on Tuesday, but the founder, Mark Zuckerberg, and the chief operating officer, Sheryl Sandberg, did not attend. Our media editor, Emil Rajan, Rajan, spoke to us from San Francisco. The first thing that Facebook is going to do is get all of the information about, about what they knew and when. It's still unclear. The accounts given about who knew what and when 
uh, vary between the whistleblower that used to work for Cambridge Analytica, a chap called Chris Wiley, a Canadian man, and what Facebook themselves and Cambridge Analytica have said. So all of the information about who knew what and when needs to be made clear. We also need to know the extent to which the data breach, or if it wasn't a breach, the data leak, the fact that 50 million people were reportedly uh, had their information out there, we need to know exactly when that happened and what Facebook did about it. And the other issue is that I think that Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg need to come out in public and say something about this issue. It's very striking the echoes with when there was first talk about Russians using Facebook to spread fake news and disinformation. Mark Zuckerberg said the idea that it had influenced the 2016 election of President Trump was a pretty crazy idea. He recanted a few months uh, later, and on this one too, it looks like he's staying silent when Facebook staff it's certainly very clear in their messaging here. They need leadership and they want to hear from him. Facebook boss Mike Zuckerberg has been called by the US Congress to give evidence about the use of personal data by Cambridge Analytica. The consulting firm, whose boss has been suspended on Tuesday, is accused of harvesting the data of 50 million Facebook users without permission and failing to delete it when told so. They say they have done nothing wrong. As to Facebook as well, the US Senate, however, wants Mr. Zuckerberg to testify in person. He's also much in demand by MPs here in the UK who want to explain Facebook's treatment of users' data. Uh, Republican Senator uh, uh, John Kennedy told the BBC the issues of privacy and social media go well beyond just Facebook. I would want to very respectfully but, and politely but firmly suggest to Mr. Zuckerberg that he needs to come talk to us. My intent in all this is not to trash Facebook. I think Facebook has done wonderful things. It's brought a lot of people together. It's helped, helped to spread democracy. It does, in many ways, bring us closer together, but it also, in other ways, it brings us further apart. Here, I'm talking about Facebook because uh, the Cambridge Analytical issue had to do with Facebook, but you can make the same argument for Twitter, Google, the other social media companies. I mean, let me say it again, they're not companies. I'm proud of them, they're American companies. But, but they're not American companies. They're not even companies anymore. They're countries. They're, they're breathtakingly powerful. They know more about me than me. They know more about you than you. And we need to talk about the, the, the socioeconomic and cultural problems that their size presents. So could this scandal over data protection become a turning point for Facebook and other technology companies or countries as the Senator put it? We're joined now by Dr. Daniel Dresner, who is a cyber security expert from the University of Manchester. Uh, welcome to the program, Dr. Dresner. Well, a very clear, gentle call for Zuckerberg there to testify, will he? Uh, well, it's always difficult to know. I, I, think, I think he would because um, one of the problems that we've got is a lot of what is done uh, doesn't actually hit the the, uh, the actual illegal uh, category itself. Uh, it hits the morals and ethics side of stuff. So people use uh, you know clever, um, rather unfair perhaps tactics of uh, of giving us things that we sign up for in a lot of the, 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 the these fora. Um, but obviously, I think in, the, in in this case it would seem um, uh, you know allegedly etc. That um, data has been taken um, you know beyond those particular boundaries. So I think he would, I think he would testify, but I think he would uh, also be bringing the fact of you know, all the wonderful good that he's done uh, and saying how he's within the law. But then again, you know, you know, is it, isn't it a little bit uh, spooky, the kind of stuff that uh, is now done with the information that, uh, that we give over? And the Senator pointed to the power of social media platforms calling them now countries rather than companies. Uh, we have to remember that you know, our data has been harvested for years, but, you know, and Facebook is not the only one to do this. Are we seeing a change here because of social media platforms? Um, I, yeah, I think it's a little bit overdramatic describing them as countries. Uh, they're, they're essentially uh, the, the old-fashioned newspapers, but perhaps with uh, you know, a bigger reach uh, and with, an, uh, so I suppose, a cheaper way of collecting uh, new stories because, of course, everybody pours the information, pours the uh, what's going on much down to, uh, to a lower level. So, you know, perhaps out of this some kind of good will come uh, and we can get a little bit of a better handle on the, on the boundaries. But, of course, one of the 
bottom of the boundaries uh, and the data is you know is where it's collected in one country and used in another and the differing in laws I mean that's quite an important part of the nat our national cyber security strategy uh, that we are, that we're looking at to work out ways to make these jurisdictions less of a barrier to uh, encouraging good behaviors and being able to uh, you know deter the bad ones because we've got the uh, jurisdiction to you know to prosecute when bad stuff like this happens well Facebook shares are down very briefly will it have any impact on Facebook at all um, I think it will have certainly some short-term impact, um, but uh, it, it's not often that this kind of thing, you know, really sort of blows something out of the water. I mean, obviously there are cases um, where, you know, with, I mean, with essentially this is not, this is a kind of data breach, uh, after all. And uh, we saw what ha what's happened with the Mossack Fonseca over the last over the last few weeks. Uh, slightly different different thing, but it actually does show you um, what could happen. Okay, Dr. Jessen, thank you. Please welcome to the stage, Alexander Nix, Chief Executive Officer of Cambridge Analytica. It's September 2016, and Alexander Nix is at the Concordia Summit in New York City. It's my privilege to speak to you today about the power of big data in the electoral process. Tall and bespectacled, with the look of a 19th century aristocrat, Nix paces the stage and explains the importance of psychographics. That is an understanding of your personality, because it's personality that drives behavior, and behavior that obviously influences how you vote. This philosophy appears to fuel the success of both Cambridge Analytica and Nix himself. In 2017, he's the keynote speaker at the Rockstars <laughs> Festival in Hamburg, Germany. The evolution taking place in marketing and communications from madmen to math men. But someone there questions his firm's use of data gleaned from a personality quiz on Facebook. Nix says it's not Machiavellian. Well, they're voluntarily giving up their data. They're doing this in, 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 you know, in full knowledge of what's happening here. But they don't know that this data can be used to influence. I can shout in your ear, and nobody around you can hear me shouting. Charles Creel advises of the British Parliament's special committee on digital issues. And this changes the way propaganda works, because at least before, when you conducted a propaganda or influence campaign, others around you would be aware of it too. Now, I can just talk to you. Alexander Nix may have run out of influence. He had been working out of a central London office building, which tour guide Heiko Koo has now taped up with posters showing Nix behind bars. This is the most outrageous abuse. Hmm. So, Joanna, now Nix has been suspended, right? He's no longer, at least for the moment, the CEO of this firm. What, what next for him and for Cambridge Analytica? So now Congressional Democrats and the British Parliament both want him to come in and testify on the misuse of data. So mm -hmm. we'll be seeing how that goes. All right, and here's Joanna Kakissis in London for us this morning. Thanks, Joanna. You're welcome, Rachel. And this is Morning Edition from NPR News. There are concrete steps that Facebook could take to make people feel better right out of the crisis management handbook. Offer a dashboard that tells people where their data is. Let people delete data from their servers directly and show them that it's deleted. Let them opt out of targeted advertising the way you can on, for example, Apple iPhones. But the company won't do any of that, and it's because that's where the money is, and that just creates this ongoing cynicism about the company's response. Facebook has launched an internal investigation into what it sees as the misuse of its data by Cambridge Analytica, a UK-based data firm that's now suspended its CEO. And now the U.S. Federal Trade Commission is looking into all this. This isn't the first time Facebook has been in the FTC's crosshairs. Facebook ended up signing a consent, a consent decree in 2011 after the FTC accused it of deceiving consumers by telling them they could keep their information on Facebook private and then allowing it to be shared and made public. Facebook didn't admit guilt in signing the consent decree, but it did agree to get users consent before sharing their data beyond their privacy preferences. The consent decree carries the force of law. Facebook would have to pay penalties of up to $16,000 for each violation of the decree. In 2012, the FTC fined Google about $22 million after accusing Google of misrepresenting privacy guarantees for users of Apple's Safari browser. 
at the centre of this storm. Facebook with its 2 billion users and vast revenues. And a small consultancy, Cambridge Analytica, that's accused of misusing the data of millions of people, perhaps to try to influence the outcome of the 2016 US presidential election. Last night, its CEO was suspended. But there's a third player in all this too, a Cambridge University researcher called Dr. Alexander Kogan, who created the app that harvested all that data in the first place. Facebook says he violated its terms of use by passing it on to Cambridge Analytica. Needless to say, he has a different version of events. And for the first time, we can hear that. He's been talking exclusively to the BBC's Michelle Hussein. First, how exactly did he collect people's information? Users go and authorize each app to access certain data. So things that are very public about you, such as your name, age, and gender, and then certain things that maybe just your friends can see, such as your page likes, your wall posts, and your pictures. And so our app was kind of on the lighter side in terms of the things we collect, which we just wanted the public information. And the other thing that at that time the app allowed us to do is to collect similar data about your friends whose privacy settings permitted this. And so we would also get name, age, gender, location of your friends. What was your interest in this? I got really interested in trying to understand how we could model human behavior through social media because there's residue of who we are and everything we do. And here we had lots of little behaviors that we could use. And how did you start working with Cambridge Analytica? Initially, they just wanted me to help them with some survey consulting. And then the conversation progressed, and we started doing a project on Facebook. What sort of project? So the focus uh, of the project was on Americans, and the idea was to collect data and to make predictions, or best guesses really, about how they would answer certain surveys, and in particular, personality surveys. And this was in 2014. Who approached whom? Uh, they approached me. They've said something entirely different. They have said Alexander Nix, who's now been suspended as the chief executive, says we were approached by an academic who said he had the legitimate and legal wherewithal to collect data on Facebook users that we might be able to use. Is that correct? Uh, in my opinion, that's a fabrication. What happened was they approached me, they wrote the terms of service for the app, they provided the legal advice that this was all appropriate. How did you then go about collecting it? We recruited, I think, around 200,000 people through a survey company called Qualtrics. Each person was paid to do the survey and to authorize the app, and each person was presented with specific data we were going to try to collect, and also a terms of service that SEL had drafted for us that detailed exactly the commercial terms of the project. So they knew that they were signing over their data for commercial purposes? Uh, that's my understanding. They communicated that this would be a fully commercial project and that the terms of service would be ones that allowed sort of a broad license for usage. What about the data of their friends? Uh, same thing. I mean, it was their view that this was an appropriate project. And you know, what was communicated to me strongly is that thousands, and maybe ten, tens of thousands of apps were doing the exact same thing and that this was a pretty normal use case and a normal situation for usage of Facebook data. But the people, the Facebook users who were agreeing to let you use their data for commercial reasons, were they also agreeing to that for their friends' data? That certainly was my understanding of what was communicated to me. Have you not gone back and checked the details given the huge row over all of this in recent days? Yeah. So that, that is still my understanding, but the, I think the legal situation is nuanced. Um, and like, I don't want to mis, mis, uh, state anything at all in terms of how the, it all works. But the, my understanding is that we were completely within the, the limits and the, the rights of the agreements that we had. And how many profiles did you end up with from those 200,000 people? In terms of data we provided to SEL, it was 30 million people, and they were all Americans, based on self-report. And how did Cambridge Analytica use that data? Honestly, I don't know. I was never part of the subsequent process. Certainly, I've read many reports, just like everybody else has, but I have no way of actually first-hand knowing any of that. Facebook are now saying 
that you violated their platform policies when you passed the information that you got from there to Cambridge Analytica. I mean, Why are you I'm saying that's not answer. correct? I mean, like, I'm honestly stunned by most of this. This has never been my understanding. The, like, the events of the past week have been a total shell shock. And my view is that I'm being basically used as a scapegoat by both Facebook and Cambridge Analytica when, honestly, the, we thought we were acting perfectly appropriately. We, we thought we were doing something that was really normal, and we were assured by Cambridge Analytica that like, everything was perfectly legal and within the limits of the terms of service. But you're a highly knowledgeable, highly skilled person. Are you saying you totally relied on information that Cambridge Analytica gave you and didn't ask questions of yourself about this huge amount of data, 30 million profiles that you had gathered? One of the, the great mistakes I did here was I just didn't ask enough questions. I mean, I had never done a commercial project. I didn't really have any reason to doubt their sincerity. That's certainly something I strongly regret now. I mean, the, you know, I was doing the project for free. I didn't have money to go get a lawyer. I would have certainly done that in retrospect. But the, You were doing the project for free? I've never profited from this in any way personally. But you, you were paid by Cambridge lost. Analytica, weren't you? Your company was paid by Cambridge Absolutely. Analytica. So they provided resources to pay for the cost of the data collection. Which was how much? Somewhere between seven and eight hundred thousand dollars. So your company was paid close to a million dollars for its Facebook data set. Yes, but to, to just to be clear where this goes, this money was paid mostly to Qualtrics directly for the participants, because each person it would cost three to four dollars, and so that's where really the money went. Do you think you've done anything wrong? I think the only thing I really did wrong was not ask enough questions. There's nothing that I've seen that would lead me to believe there was any violation of any policies. You say that you don't know how your data set was used. It was this large data set of Americans. If it turns out it was used in the American presidential uh, campaign, how will that make you feel? Absolutely horrible. Uh, Mr. Trump is not somebody whose values align well with mine. And at the same time, though, the I know that it probably wasn't helpful. The, the accuracy of this data has been extremely exaggerated. In practice, my best guess is that we were six times more likely to get everything wrong about a person as we were to get everything right about a person. Like, I personally don't think micro-targeting is an effective way to use such data sets. Well, we put Dr. Kogan's version of events to Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Facebook insisted that he had violated its platform policies by transferring the data his app had collected to Cambridge Analytica. It also said he specifically assured Facebook the data would never be used for commercial purposes. Uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, didn't respond specifically to his claims. Uh, let's talk to our technology correspondent, Rory Kettle jones who's on the line now. Rory, um, Dr. Kogan sounded a bit vague when he was talking about those uh, legalities. Wasn't it pretty clear cut. I mean, either you, you, you give permission for your data to be used in certain ways or you don't. Rory Kettle and Jones, can you hear me? Absolutely fine. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes, yeah, sorry, the slight interrupt. Oh, the line sounds a bit dodgy. Not a good, not a good look for our technology correspondent. Rory, can you hear me? Well, we seem to have lost the line um, to... Uh, Rory, uh, we'll try and re-establish that line and get uh, his comment. We're going to be returning to the story a little later. We're going to be talking to a British MP who summoned uh, the Facebook uh, CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, to appear. That's coming up in about 15 uh, minutes' time. Joining me now in studio is Ben Tarnoff, technology and politics columnist at the London-based Guardian. He is also the founder, founding editor of Logic, a magazine about technology. Ben, welcome to On Point. Thanks so much for having me. So give us the latest. We know that Cambridge Analytica's CEO is out. Uh, Facebook execs are facing the heat on Capitol Hill. Catch us up on what's going on. So there are a lot of questions about what Cambridge Analytica did with the data that they improperly acquired from about 50 million Facebook profiles. We know that they purchased it from a Cambridge University academic named Alexander Kogan, who himself collected it by having 270,000 users take a personality quiz, which was an app on Facebook 
But that personality quiz harvested information not only from those users, but from all of their friends as well, without those people's consent or knowledge. So understandably, politicians and regulators in both the United States and the United Kingdom have a lot of questions about this. And you're talking about these quizzes. I mean, those of us who use Facebook, we've taken quizzes, you know, what kind of superhero are you and such. Is this a widespread use of this type of data mining? Well, this was a feature that Facebook offered developers who build apps on its platform from about 2010 to when they shut it down from 2014 to 2015. And this feature essentially allowed third-party applications to acquire vast amounts of information, not only from the user that installed that application, but from their friends as well. So it was a way for essentially third parties to build their own mini Facebooks because they could acquire millions and millions of people's information. So ex-Facebook exec Sandy Parakilis said that this kind of data harvesting was routine. How widespread a practice is this? Well, I think we can assume that this is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, this API feature in particular gave such unrestricted access to friends' information, we can assume that many, many developers took advantage of this. But we have to keep in mind, even though this particular feature has been shut down, this is the fundamental business model of Facebook. So even if it's not Cambridge Analytica harvesting all this information, Facebook harvests all this information about its 2 billion users, and that should really concern people. All right, here's a clip from the secretly recorded conversation between undercover Channel 4 news reporters and Cambridge Analytica's chief data officer, Alex Taylor, and the managing director, Mark Turnbull, uh, published this week. The reporters posed as potential clients interested in swaying the Sri Lankan elections. If you're collecting data on people and you're profiling them, that gives you more insight that you can use to know how to segment the population, to give them messaging about issues they care about, and language and imagery that they're likely to engage with. And we use that in America, and we use that in Africa. That's right. what we do as a company. Yeah. We've done it in Mexico, we've done it in Malaysia, and now we begin to Brazil. Sector of just China. Brazilian being Australia, China. For China also. Just something in China, not in politics. So Ben, they're boasting about using this information to try to affect elections across the globe. Absolutely. So this is important to keep in mind, which is that Cambridge Analytica itself is a legal fiction. The real organization here is SCL Group. SCL Group has run PSYOPs campaigns all over the world, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Middle East, and they've done so on behalf of militaries, on behalf of governments, and in particular, the US and the UK government as well. The State Department in particular has been uh, a customer of SCL Group services. So this is quite widespread. So Facebook is saying, look, we didn't know this was happening. We're as much of a victim here uh, as the users who were involved in that. Is that true, or does Facebook bear uh, the, a big chunk of the blame here? I would say Facebook bears almost all of the blame. They put out a statement recently saying that they are completely outraged and that they're working hard to fix the situation. But anyone within Facebook knows that this is how they make money, right? Facebook makes its money from advertising, and in particular targeted advertising. They can't sell targeted advertising without surveillance. So surveillance is the basis of how Facebook makes money. Okay, uh, I'd like to bring another voice into the conversation. Joining me now in studio is Emily Dreyfus, former senior staff writer at Wired, covering technology and national affairs. She is now doing the Neiman Journalism oh. Fellowship at Harvard. Emily, welcome back to On Point. Thanks for having me, Kim. So, we're talking about big data. Big data is something people have been concerned about for a long time. How is that data stored, collected? How is it used? What about this, if anything, is different? You know, I think that we've been waiting to see if there would be a tipping point when the opacity of big data and the danger of the surveillance mechanism of technology that Ben was just referencing would actually uh, burst into people's consciousness and make people really aware and concerned about how their footprint and interaction with 
the so-called free internet is actually affecting their lives. Um, I think what is interesting about this point is perhaps people finally understand how gross this is and how the business model that underpins the social web uh, really does depend on, on, on us giving up a lot of ourselves and um, giving our agency away to these technology companies. So I do think this is different. I think it's also just compounded. Facebook has been hit uh, with you know PR scandals sort of like this for about a year now, uh, maybe two. And I think that this is finally maybe going to make a difference. And so I know uh, the issue of regulation has come up and, and lawmakers have been trying to figure out what, if anything, they can do to regulate this. In the, in the uh, UK, there is regulation. Would th tell us a little bit about what they're doing there and could that work in America? So uh, the European Union has a law that will be passing, will be implemented soon in May called uh, GDPR. And this law is huge and immense. Ben and I were just talking about how complicated it is. Uh, but essentially what it will do is try to give users of the internet back some rights. And the main rights are that they have to give technology companies their consent before their data can be used. And they have the right to know how that information is being used. So when this law is enacted in May, companies like Facebook, Google, Slack, all the big technology companies that you, uh, we all use every single day as part of our lives will have to let us know what they are collecting of ours. They'll have to give us the chance to opt out. Rather than right now, we are on all these platforms, we are opted in by default. And what we can do is go into the settings on Facebook somewhere and you know, check a box that says, actually, I don't want you to send my data to third parties. But people don't know to do that because they don't know it's there. What this law will say is, wait, the default needs to be that you're not sending that information and people can choose with uh, conscious consent to opt in. This, this is going to be huge. It's going to change the way that technology companies are dealing with this data in Europe, but it's going to have really big cascading impacts for us even here in America because as these companies figure out how to comply with the law, they're going to have to make changes that will affect us even here. Okay, Sonia is calling uh, from Decatur, Illinois. Hi, Sonia. Hello, Kim. How are you? I'm good. You're on point. Um, okay, the thing that I want to say, you can't totally blame Facebook for everything. There is not one app that is on that you can put on your phone or anything else that doesn't tell you that it needs connection to your personal data. So there's a lot of apps that I will not use because they need access to my contacts and my pictures and why in the world do they need that just for me to have an app on my phone? Yes, Sonia is making a, a point I think a lot of our listeners have. Uh, what do you think, Ben? Well, I think it's an important point, which is that Facebook does provide a useful service Many people enjoy being on Facebook. I know I do. I mean, I can see my friends' baby photos and, and stay in touch with, uh, with relatives and so on. I think Facebook, in a sense, is inescapable, right? And I think that's actually a really important point, is that the solution to this is not to quit Facebook. It's not to delete Facebook. Facebook has become one of the digital infrastructures that, for better or worse, and often recently worse, rule our lives. So the question, I think, is less about how do we take an off-ramp from Facebook, how do we exit Facebook, and more about how do we reform it and regulate it so that we can get the benefits of a social media platform, which we all enjoy, while we're also having a democratic conversation about what the trade-offs are. I'm not sure necessarily that we have to be absolutists on all of these privacy questions. All I'm suggesting is that as a society, we have a democratic conversation and make democratic decisions about what those trade-offs are. And Emily, I mean, we know a little bit about these trade-offs when we agree to go on these social media platforms. Is there a responsibility on the part of the user? Yeah, I mean, you know, we should be informed. And you know, your caller, Sonia, is right that most of these apps that you can install on your phone or through Facebook will give you some sort of boilerplate about how they're going to need access. The question is whether or not it's too much of a burden to 
put on people to know how that information is going to be used or misused in the future. And the truth is, no one can really know because we're just learning how it's being abused right now. All right, we'll ask our guests to hold tight. We're talking about Facebook, internet privacy, and social media company obligations to users in the wake of the massive Cambridge Analytica data breach. You can join the conversation. Are you joining the people who are deleting Facebook for good? Do you think Cambridge Analytica helped elect President Trump? We're discussing Facebook's data breach and the social network's responsibility to its users. You can join the conversation. Do you believe the boasting from Cambridge Analytica's now suspended CEO that the company helped elect Donald Trump? If given the chance, what would you ask Mark Zuckerberg? We're at 1-800-423-8255. That's 1-800-423-TALK. You can also follow us on Twitter and find us on Facebook at On Point Radio. I'm speaking with Ben Tarnoff, columnist at The Guardian, covering technology and politics, and Emily Dreyfus, former writer at Wired, covering technology and national affairs. She's now doing a fellowship at Harvard. So, Ben, uh, Cambridge Analytica, this was a company with close ties to uh, Trump campaign operatives like Steve Bannon. Uh, Talk a little bit about that, and are there other companies working with campaigns closely on data mining? So Steve Bannon and Robert Mercer, who is a hedge fund billionaire who is a major funder of, of Trump's campaign, set up Cambridge Analytica in 2013. And it's worked on a number of American political campaigns, including the Ted Cruz campaign, because Mercer backed Cruz before he switched over to Trump. Mercer himself comes from a computer science background. He actually helped invent algorithmic trading. So he, in particular, is very drawn to the idea of using data mining and analysis to influence voter behavior. And that seems to also accord with Steve Bannon's perspective on winning the culture war. Something that Christopher Wiley said in his conversations is that Bannon in particular was very drawn to the Cambridge Analytica model as a way of trying to influence behavior and understanding in particular the connections between influencing consumer behavior and influencing political behavior, right? So selling someone a brand of shampoo is a lot like selling them a particular political candidate or a particular political cause. Uh, Christopher Wiley, who you just mentioned, uh, the data expert who oversaw Cambridge Analytica's data harvesting program, helped to blow open this story. Uh, He spoke with The the Guardian. We spent a million dollars harvesting tens of millions of Facebook profiles, and those profiles were used as the basis of the algorithms that became the foundation of Cambridge Analytica itself. The company itself was founded on using Facebook data. How often is this going on? Is this happening with other campaigns too, Emily? Um, You know, well, this was a clear violation of what Facebook wants people to be doing with this data, whether that means other people are, you know, adhering to the rules and not doing it, it remains to be seen. I think I, we can't know, but it was this information, the way that they got it, the way that Chris Wiley got it was, you know, very, very simple. And before they, before Facebook turned off the spigot for third party applications to get this data from people's friends without their consent, it, millions of people's information was harvested by third parties to which we do not know their names or how it's used. So uh, though, though this isn't going on anymore, that info, information is out there and I would think it would be safe to assume that people are using it in all sorts of ways that we don't understand. So for those of us who are not tech savvy, what should we be concerned about or what should we be doing now to protect ourselves, Ben? Well, there are a number of things that one can do modifying the privacy settings on Facebook, but ultimately it's important to keep in mind that a company like Facebook has every incentive to bury those settings, to make them difficult to understand, and it will never give you the option to opt out of its business model, right? It can only make tweaks around the edges. So I think the most important thing that people who are concerned about this could do is to contact their representatives to actually build some political momentum around this issue because this ultimately needs to be a regulatory solution. 
Yeah, and I, I can I just add, you know, um, the business model of Facebook, people have known that it was kind of gross in the way that it would target ads to you, and we were grossed out by seeing um, micro-targeted ads that knew, let's say, that I have a son, and that he is going to be three soon, and we're going to have a birthday party, and all the ads are about that. And people found that disquieting, but I think what may impel people to actually contact the representatives now is realizing that the exact same mechanisms that allow people to serve us those ads are the mechanisms that allowed you know, Russian propagandists and uh, companies like Cambridge Analytica to actually influence the democratic processes in nations. And those are two very different, uh, the, the stakes are much higher in one of those scenarios, but it's the exact same technology and the basis of which is Facebook's business model. Wow, it makes me think a lot differently about the fact that I see dog food ads after posting a picture of right. my uh, rescue terrier. Uh, <laughs> Michael is calling from Boston. Hi, Michael. Hi, Kim. This is, uh, I just wanted to make two, two points on this issue. Uh, the first point is that I'm not really sure why people are surprised about this story. Um, I think it's pretty naive. Um, so for me, when I like my friend's uh, post about his new pair of jeans. I'm not, I'm not surprised when I get an ad from Gap my pair of jeans. I think that's how, right, that's how Facebook makes money. I, of course they're sharing my data. And Facebook is a public forum just like any other public forum. If I stand in the street with a sign saying my opinion on something, well then, of course, companies are going to take that information and sell me ads based on that information. Uh, and the second point is, you know, I'm not really sure why we're thinking about this as, as necessarily a bad thing and anti-democratic. So, you know, I, 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 I love quotes all the time, which are, you know, anti-guns and um, pro-gun regulation. And then during the election, I would get hundreds of ads pro Hillary Clinton explaining that she would be strong on gun laws. Like, I found that as, as informative and helped I mean, you make, help me make the decision easier. If anything, you know, as long as both sides are, are taking advantage of, the, of this kind of technology, which clearly they are, I mean, Barack Obama's the one that uh, sort of uh, revolutionize this kind of information. Um, right. Well, then this is actually pro-democratic. Well, Michael, I'm going to pause you right there because joining us now uh, with this conversation from Washington is Congressman Adam Schiff, a Democrat uh, from California. He serves as the ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee. Congressman Schiff called uh, for Cambridge Analytica to testify before Congress. Congressman Adam Schiff, welcome to On Point. Thanks, Kim. Good to be with you. So uh, you have invited Christopher Wiley, a whistleblower who revealed the Cambridge Analytica data mining operation. What do you want to know from him? Well, we'd like to know what his role was, what the role of Cambridge Analytica was in obtaining uh, this private data belonging to tens of millions of Americans. Um, was uh, Alexander Kogan, who we've also invited to uh, come testify, uh, was he brought on for the purpose of acquiring this data? Uh, how much uh, was Facebook aware of? Uh, Facebook uh, had embeds, that is their own people working within Cambridge Analytica. Um, would it have been apparent to them where the data came from? Uh, if the data was used to create uh, look-alike groups on Facebook, uh, would that have been uh, something they could conceal? So we had a lot of questions for him, and uh, we're very grateful for his willingness to testify. Now, Cambridge Analytica is based in the UK. Uh, has that made reaching out to them difficult, and how responsive have the folks there been to you? Well, the bigger problem, frankly, we had on our committee was the unwillingness of the majority to invite most of the witnesses from Cambridge Analytica in to testify. We had requested the majority do that even when we had Alexander Nix testify, uh, he acknowledged that he's in the country frequently and was willing to come in in person, but the majority scheduled his interview by video teleconference uh, at a time when members were uh, on the hill voting and the, the site was off the hill. Uh, so they made it very difficult for us to get the answers, uh, they being the majority, uh, but nonetheless, Mr. Nix didn't make it easier either, and uh, the whistleblower's uh, statements uh, contradict, I think, substantial uh, issues uh, raised by Mr. Nix's testimony, so I think it's important that we uh, subpoena Mr. Nix and bring him before the committee and make sure that we get the truth. Uh, so yesterday, Senator John Kennedy, the Republican from Louisiana, told Bloomberg TV that he thinks that Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg needs to testify before Congress. Let's take a listen. 
Well, Mr. Zuckerberg and the other CEOs need to come. We had one hearing. They all sent their lawyers. I don't know what they paid them, but they got their money's worth because their lawyers didn't say a damn thing. What does that say to you? They dodged and bobbed and weaved, and these issues are not going away. Uh, Zuckerberg and other Facebook executives have been fairly quiet about this uh, about this controversy so far. Do you agree with the senator? I do. I think we should have them come and testify. Uh, we likewise had the general counsel for the companies come testify before the House Intelligence Committee. I thought that was an interesting choice of witnesses to be sent. Uh, it wasn't the CEOs and it wasn't the chief technology or chief security officers. Uh, they, uh, I think, through the choice of these representatives, saw this as a legal and compliance issue, uh, you know, perhaps uh, rather than uh, providing more fulsome disclosures to the committee that would be helpful in our investigation. We've learned a lot more about Russian use and abuse of their platform since then, and now with these very serious allegations that their use of data was, was abused, uh, there is all the more reason, I think, to have the very highest levels of the company come testify, and that would mean the CEOs. Congressman, what is the role of you and your colleagues here? How uh, is it? Is it a, a desire to rein in Facebook or these data mining companies? Do you plan to introduce legislation? You know, there are a whole number of issues that have come up, and they came up oddly in the context of the Russia investigation. I mean, certainly some of them are very Russia specific. Uh, in the case of Cambridge Analytica, uh, apparently there was a relationship between Cambridge Analytica and Luke Oil, the second largest oil company in Russia. Uh, the researcher that they employed to get this data also had a position on, Saint, on the faculty at St. Petersburg University or a grant with them. Uh, but the much broader issues involve the privacy of Americans, uh, users of Facebook. Uh, it involves how the algorithms on these social media platforms divide us uh, by giving us the information we want to see and maybe depriving us of any contrary information. So I think we need to do very broad oversight, not just the Intelligence Committee, but other committees as well should be exploring these issues uh, as they concern privacy and information uh, and even you know what these uh, devices do to young minds that are so addicted to them. Uh, and I think the first thing we do before we regulate is make sure we understand the problem and do our oversight. Congressman Adam Schiff, Democrat from California, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And uh, just moving on to, to some of the issues that the congressman brought up, this is about, uh, it, it, this goes very broadly, Ben. This isn't just about regulating com com companies. Uh, this is about how we use data, the privacy of individuals. This can really reach beyond uh, just Facebook, even just beyond, beyond just social media. Absolutely, right? It's much broader than Facebook. It's much broader than Cambridge Analytica. This is about our digital sphere. And our digital sphere is, these days, often where civil society takes place, right? It's where a lot of our political life takes place. So the companies, and there are a few big ones, that own this digital sphere and run it exclusively for profit have enormous power over our lives, our personal lives, our political lives, our civic lives. So we absolutely have to do something to bring that digital sphere back under democratic control. I'm Mark Mim. Hawaii's editor once wrote that the media and the public should prove that they're lucky to have each other every day. We're taking a look at regulating how social media companies handle users' personal information. You can join the conversation. What actions would you like to see Facebook take to protect personal data? How about Congress and the FTC? And now also joining me from New York via Skype is Frank Pasquale. He's a professor at the University of Maryland, and he's an expert on the law of algorithms and researches privacy laws and surveillance. And he wrote the book, The Black Box Society, The Secret Algorithms Behind Money and Information. Frank, welcome to On Point. Thank you, Kim, great to be here. Now tell us what are your concerns about data mining and the kind of thing that we saw happen at Facebook? I think that data mining in general has
has a lot of threats to it. It's not just a matter of seeing ads online. A lot of the data that's out there can be repurposed in many ways to score people, to score their health status, whether they're a criminal risk, whether they're, say, a good employee or a bad one. And so we all have a stake when data, when there's runaway data, and it's not being properly monitored and controlled. So, Frank, back up for one minute. You're talking about scoring people. Who is scoring folks, and in what way can that affect them? Well, for example, there's been a report saying that there are over 8,000 scores out there that are like credit scores. And so these are like data brokers, other firms. There are 4,000 firms, at least, that do this type of thing. Cambridge Analytica is only a very small tip of an iceberg of entities that could be using and misusing data. So what's the solution here? Is it uh, a need for regulation? Uh, are we running it all into free speech or, or First Amendment issues? No, I don't think we are. I think, you know, for this particular issue, fortunately, the Federal Trade Commission actually got a consent decree against Facebook in 2011 that specified certain things they were not supposed to do. They were not supposed to make misrepresentations about privacy or security. They were supposed to obtain affirmative express consent from their users for a lot of data uses. And I think that as we further investigate this, we may see serious fines, finally, for a company that you know, I think has managed to avoid regulation in, for far too long. So some of our listeners are reacting, uh, really struggling with what they should do and, and how uh, Facebook affects their lives. Andy uh, on Twitter writes, it's, it definitely feels inescapable. I've been wanting to quit for years because of how invasive it is, but it's also become essential to stay connected with friends and family, especially since moving halfway across the country. Uh, Mike wrote on our website, Facebook is not a part of the infrastructure. You can exist on the internet without ever needing Facebook. Frank, what do you think? What do you think people ought to do to be able to stay engaged and use social media for the great tool that it is, but also protect themselves? Well, I think there are better and worse forms of social media. So, for example, you know, I used to be on Facebook a great deal of time. I still am on it, but say I move more to Instagram, you know, or things like that. It's like if you can maybe find forms of social media where maybe there is not so much of a threat potential, where I think we've seen a lot of the threats of Facebook um, sort of being criticized throughout this hour. But I think ultimately, though, this is a regulatory matter. I've heard uh, you know, both Emily and Ben talk about the need for regulation. I completely agree because the problem is that even if you're on Facebook, Facebook may be on you in the sense that they have shadow profiles. So this is a bit like the Equifax situation, right? Mm. Nobody can choose not to be have a file with Equifax, so we have to regulate them. And I think the same thing is going on here. All right, Ada is on the line from Providence, Rhode Island. Hi there, Ada. Hi, Kim. I just have one quick comment. I, I like Facebook, but I think we as a society have given up way too much of our personal information. You can be on Facebook, you can connect with friends and family, but it's also our responsibility to, to decide what we are going to share. Um, I don't know that over-regulation, and I am a liberal, I don't think that over-regulating uh, something like this is the right move, but that's just my opinion. I think we, as a society, should take responsibility for what we decide to put out there, to share. Um, mm -hmm. We are thinking people, and we should use the brain to think and mm -hmm. not put our whole lives out there. Yeah, Ada, thank you for that call. Dave, David is calling from Nashville, Tennessee. Hi there, David. Hi, Kim. Um, so to echo the previous caller, I think that's a bigger conversation that unfortunately no one's having. There's a conversation to be had around regulation, very important, but we should be realistic about our government agencies and what they're able and, and effective at, especially these days. Um, they're way behind the curve in terms of this, and it's not to say they shouldn't be addressing it, but where is the larger conversation around choice here? The populace has a choice. It's not as though if we stop using Facebook, we're, the, the air will be sucked out of the room. Food will no longer be available. It feels like there's not a real conversation here around saying, letting the market respond. Yeah. The market tells Facebook, 
I'm no longer going to be at the mercy, or maybe they modify their business model and it becomes a subscription model. But yeah. yeah, thanks, David. What, what do you think about that, Emily? So I think David and Ada both bring up a really good point, um, which is that you, know, you, you don't want to over-regulate into the ground something that people really value. And I think we're hearing that from a lot of the callers on the show. Facebook really does provide a service to people. I think that what's important to understand is that this, if we were to regulate Facebook, we, the idea would not be to uh, limit what people could say or limit what Facebook could allow you to do, but rather to actually, I think, enable what both Ada and David were, were calling for, which is the ability to make an informed decision about how you use Facebook. Right now, and Frank can speak to this you know, probably much better than I can, but the, the black box that is Facebook, that is how the algorithm works, that is how its surveillance mechanism works, that is how it sells and brokers its data to other parties, that's something that we currently, journalists, regulators, you know, Congress people, do not have access to that information, which means we can't really be making an informed decision about what it means to use or not use Facebook. And then that's what the regulation in Europe is trying to allow, is for people to, to know what's going on so they can then make a choice that is informed. And Ray, uh, who wrote on our website, Ray from uh, Vermont, had a similar point. He wrote that while Facebook has rules or guidelines as to how data uh, collected from users can be used, is there any evidence that those rules are informed and if violations are found, when uh, then what recourse does either the company or the affected users have? What about that, Frank? Ray is exactly right. And what we're finding out is that people within the company who said, watch out, this, this whistleblower Parapilis, who you quoted earlier, who said, watch out, this is terrible, we've got to proactively audit developers to see what's going on with their data. It looks like those people were silenced. Mm -hmm. So it looks as though the choice was made within the company to privilege and prioritize massive profits, not just normal profits, but massive profits over the interests of users. And that's, and Emily is exactly right to say that we don't understand the black box. I talked to a federal trade commissioner, one of the top privacy officials in this country, and I said, do you know where these companies get their data from and where the data is going to? And she laughed. She said that is so hard for them to monitor, to get a handle on, that you know they weren't even trying at that time. You know, they just put out a few reports, et cetera, to get around the edges, but it was so hard for them to monitor this data landscape. Mm. So we can take it seriously. We've taken it seriously in healthcare and finance regulation. We've got to bring those models to the internet. And then now the FTC is stepping in. What can or might they do about this? Well, as Frank mentioned, Facebook is almost certainly in violation of the 2011 consent decree. And they could pursue pretty substantial fines. The numbers we've been seeing is about 40,000 per violation. So if you do 40,000 times 50 million, I can't do that much math in my head, but it, but it goes up into the certainly the millions, potentially the trillions of dollars. I think it remains to be seen in this particular political configuration in Washington whether the political will exist to pursue that kind of action. All right, Lincoln is calling from Boston. Hi, Lincoln. Hi, Jim. Jim, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for calling on point. Uh, I, Zuckerberg was quoted in 2013 as saying that privacy is obsolete. <laughs> and I, I really don't understand where everybody in, in the politically correct world all this time is just, just not acknowledge that. And, you know, the communists, uh, during the time of communism, they uh, monitored private communications, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, of the citizens, and that's how they controlled uh, until they failed communism. And I don't see what the difference is here other than we're talking about business. And um, people need to vote with their uh, wallets. So there's changes. I don't think, I think that technology is so far ahead of uh, uh, regulation that re whether you regulate or not is really going to have any effect. Thanks, Lincoln. What do you think about that, Emily? Yeah, I mean, I think Lincoln brings up a really good point, which is that. Um, you know, as Ben mentioned earlier, the entire business model of Facebook is surveillance. And we have known that. And when, when Zuckerberg said, you know, privacy is obsolete, what he meant was, he was very overt. This is, this is you're giving me this information and I'm gonna use it to sell you shoes. And I think that the fact that it, it was, that that surveillance funds capitalism is what has made us as a people think it wasn't that big of a deal. 
because that surveillance was just going to be used to try to make money, sell us things, and hey, that's how society functions. But but what this uh, story that we're talking about here with Cambridge Analytica, and, and Frank used a really great term to talk about it, runaway data, shows that like, sure, that data was originally maybe gathered for the purposes of furthering capitalism and just to sell us some stuff, but that's not how it was ultimately used by a third party who had no business having it. It was then used to actually sway society and, and, and our government. Um, so, you know, I, I think Lincoln is absolutely right that there we have opted in, maybe you could say, or maybe it was thrust upon us to a new surveillance reality that surrounds us, that these companies are in charge of. And, uh, you know, we used to only worry about the government surveilling us. And now it, these companies are really a part of that mechanism in a way that even the government doesn't necessarily understand. We're listening to On Point. We're hearing this very enlightening, kind of scary conversation about Facebook, about data, about your privacy. You're going to hear a lot about this in the coming days, maybe in snippets, but On Point here today, they are breaking it all down and really helping us understand this story better. And that is what On Point brings you day in and day out here. So there, there are lots and lots of safeguards there. One of the headline story we've uh, been looking at, the British Foreign Secretary has uh, drawn a parallel between Vladimir Putin and Adolf Hitler. What do you know? Let's return to our main story here on Musao, the continuing fallout uh, after Facebook has faced uh, allegations that uh, the data analytics company Cambridge uh, Analytica uh, misused Facebook users' data. Uh, as you heard earlier in the program, we were expecting a statement from uh, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, and just in the last few minutes we've got that statement. Uh, it's quite long, but in it Mr. Zuckerberg says that Facebook made mistakes regarding the Cambridge Analytica uh, situation. He also announced that Facebook would investigate all apps that had access to large amounts of data before changes uh, to rules the company produced in 2014 and he says that Facebook will further restrict the access developers of third-party apps uh, have to user data. Well, earlier we discussed the EU's efforts to subject the uh, big digital companies such as Facebook and Google to more stringent regulation. Should they also pay more tax? It's a question our business editor Kamal Ahmed asked the European Commissioner for Economic and Financial Affairs, Pierre Moscovici. The answer is clear. No. They don't. Uh, it's not totally their fault that, that the uh, corporate tax system has been designed one century ago uh, for companies which have a physical presence. If you are a car company, you know how many workers you have, where are the plants, etc., etc. And so it's easy to tax uh, for those companies and others because it's not an anti-GAFA tax that we are proposing today. Uh, there is no physical presence. So the result is that, uh, as far as we know, those companies pay something like 9% uh, corporate tax, while the rest of the economy pays 23%. And th there is a problem of level playing field, a problem of fairness and equity there. And it, it can't go on that way. Those companies uh, need to pay their fair share of tax where they create profits and value. And this is what our initiative is about. Just that, but totally that. Tell us how you propose to solve this incredibly difficult issue, which for years has bogged down governments, tax authorities. Nobody's been able to come up with an agreeable solution to taxing the digital giants like Facebook and Google more than they tax them at the moment. There are two problems. The first one is legal. Uh, since uh, the, the, the criteria for uh, our corporate tax is uh, physical presence, we need to define what digital presence is about. And uh, we have set uh, some technical criteria in order to fix uh, where value is created and linked to uh, the user. Uh, and this is our main proposal, uh, which is to incorporate this digital presence in, into our national corporate tax system and, and tomorrow into a, a common consolidated corporate tax base system. And this is the uh, tax system of the 21st century that we want to design. This is the legal issue. 
There is also a fiscal issue. The fact that those companies don't pay their fair share of tax creates a, a revenue loss for our treasuries. That it's hard to estimate, but uh, uh, probably around five to seven billion euros. And this is why we need to design a short-term measure which is capable of creating uh, some revenue uh, based on uh, the activity of those uh, companies. And that's what we propose as a short-term entry measure, uh, which should be replaced by a more structural approach as soon as possible. The European Commission for Economic and Financial Affairs, Pierre Moscovici, and he was talking to Kamal Ahmed. <laughs> is hanging over the midterm elections this fall, it's this. What is the best way to protect the vote from foreign interference? The Senate Intelligence Committee took up that question at a hearing today. First context, there's been a lot of attention on the Russians hacking of emails and their disinformation campaign during the 2016 election, but did they also target state election systems? They did, that's right, and, and that's in large part why there's so much concern right now about making sure that state voting systems are secure ahead of the midterms. And this is important because public confidence in the integrity of an election uh, and the results is really a key part of how U.S. democracy works. Uh, now, why the concern? As you said, the Russians targeted election systems in 2016. The Department of Homeland Security says that happened in 21 states. DHS says the Russians managed to access a system in only one state. That was a voter registration database in Illinois. Officials say no data was changed, no vote tallies were changed, but the security of election systems, and when I say that I'm talking about everything from voter databases to voting machines used on election day, is still a really big concern here. This isn't just fears that vote tallies could be changed. There are concerns that a foreign adversary, take Russia, could delete voter, uh, voters from voter rolls, for example, on a large enough scale that it could lead to chaos on election day and doubts about the integrity of the election itself. Well, how concerned are U.S. officials that Russia or another country will try to hack the midterm elections? They're very concerned. Uh, for months, senior U.S. intelligence officials and lawmakers have been warning that 2016 wasn't a one-off for Russia. They say the Kremlin will try to interfere again. They say other countries could follow uh, Russia's lead. Today, DHS Secretary uh, Kirsten Nielsen reiterated this point in her testimony. Here's a bit of what she had to say. We think the threat remains high. Uh, we think vigilance is important, and we think there's a lot that we all need to do uh, at all levels of government uh, before we have the midterm elections. Now, another DHS official said today that the, the, the department hasn't seen anything at this point that would suggest that a foreign adversary might be testing systems ahead of the midterms, but there's still a lot of concern that this is a potential target. Okay, so what is the government doing to safeguard future elections? Well, one of the big problems in 2016 was communication between federal government uh, on one hand and state and local election officials on another. It took a year for DHS to inform states that their systems were targeted by Russia. Uh, one thing that hampered the feds from sharing information with state officials was uh, that a lot of the information was classified. So DHS says it's working to fix that. Already about 20 out of 150 state election officials have received security clearances, and the uh, DHS secretary said today that if the department has information of a threat, it can share it immediately with state officials, even state officials who don't have clearance yet. Um, she said that more than half the states have signed up for a DHS cyber scanning service, which would help identify potential probing. Uh, but there are also some very simple steps that can be taken to help secure the vote and ensure confidence in it. One of the most important is making sure that a voting system leaves a paper trail that can be audited. Old school paper ballots are one example of this. Uh, as one person said today, you can't hack a piece of paper. And this is important because right now five states are entirely paperless in their voting, and several others have areas, jurisdictions that have paperless voting. Okay, final question. It's reasonable to assume that some of these changes will cost money. Who's going to pay for it? Money is always an issue, isn't it? Uh, a lot of the voting machines used in states are, are old, um, in many cases more than a decade old. Uh, Committee Chairman Richard Burr said today that upwards of $400 million uh, for election security could be in the spending bill that Congress is looking to pass this week. Uh, but again, the clock is ticking on this. It takes time to get this stuff done. Some primaries have already happened. They're really going to get going in the late spring. So time is short, and lawmakers say this is urgent. Got to get it done. Yes, Brian, thank you. Thank you. This is All Things Considered from NPR News. It's not really a surprise that people's personal data on Facebook was gathered and sold and spread around. Most people have known for quite some time now that our information online is far from secure. Far from 
But the recent news about Cambridge Analytica getting millions of people's information seems to have hit a nerve. We wanted to get some perspective on this, so we've called Siva Vandianathan. He is a media studies professor at the University of Virginia, and he's with us now. Professor, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Michelle. It's good to talk to you. Well, this, this has sparked an outcry and some calls to hashtag delete Facebook. Do you think this is a real thing? I, I think it's a thing among uh, an elite strata of Twitter users. I don't think it's going to turn into a mass movement, nor do I necessarily think it should. You know, uh, people who study social media, people who do data science, privacy advocates, even the Federal Trade Commission, we've all known about this practice that Facebook has had since about 2010. You know, since about 2010, Facebook has been sort of promiscuously and notoriously duplicitous and irresponsible with our data. Now, people are ups upset about it, and they should be, but they should have been upset about it then too, and some of us were, but nobody was paying attention because Facebook was this shiny, happy, new company. And you were suggesting that this has been an open secret for years. Is there something about this episode, though, that feels different to you? Oh, it feels different in terms of the public awareness. Uh, you know, I think that's a major change. And the fact that there seems to be growing dissatisfaction with Facebook, that's been building since the 2016 election, when it was pretty clear that President Trump had exploited Facebook successfully, but that was accompanied by serious propaganda efforts, disinformation and misinformation efforts, from certain agents coming out of Russia, right? Facebook is just barely coming to terms with it, but I think there's public awareness that I wish had been around before the damage was done. So you're saying you think there is something about this episode that's hitting a nerve. You know, why now is this the episode that is getting all this attention? Well, I think there's a bit of spy novel <laughs> uh, to this whole latest episode, right? Cambridge Analytica itself is this sort of secretive front company that is controlled by a billionaire genius, uh, Robert Mercer, and Steve Bannon, you know, is on the board. And the people who run Cambridge Analytica seem to brag about their ability to manipulate minds. The, the spy novel elements of it are very attractive, right? Here's an actual narrative, an actual story for people to get shocked about. I, I think people are probably getting the, the clue right now that you are a bit of a Facebook critic. Uh, yes. Um, you have a book coming out soon called Anti-Social Media, How Facebook Disconnects Us and Undermines Democracy. But I do want to ask if you think that this issue is unique to Facebook. It's unique to Facebook because Facebook is so pervasive, right? 2.2 billion people use Facebook every month around the world. That is a tremendous amount of power. It's cultural power, it's intellectual power, it's political power, it's financial power. It's an incredibly important part of people's lives around the world. Well, that, yeah, that kind of leads to the question I was going to conclude with is, is there anything that people can do if they are upset about this, if they are worried about their privacy being invaded, or if they don't like the uses to which their, this information has been put, is there anything people can do? Can they sure. delete their profiles? Yeah, I mean, we could delete our profiles, a few hundred thousand Americans delete their profiles, it doesn't matter because, you know, a few hundred thousand people in India just signed up from Facebook. So, uh, that's not going to hurt Facebook. Like, you should delete your Facebook profile if Facebook puts you in a bad mood, if it distracts you at work, if you're getting into nasty arguments with your uncle. You know, those are reasons to get off of Facebook, but don't get off of Facebook because you think it's going to make a difference to Facebook or to the world. If you have a problem with how Facebook has misled us abused our privileges, uh, abused our relationship with them, we need to use the instruments of regulation to curb its power. So if we act as citizens, we have a chance. If we act as Facebook users, we have no chance. That's Steve Vandianathan. He is a media studies professor at the University of Virginia. Professor, thanks so much for speaking with us. Thank you, Michelle. This was a pleasure. Uh, and he says more changes are in the works, so stay tuned. I would note Zuckerberg did not address the giant elephant in the room, you know, which is why did Facebook have to learn from news outlets that Cambridge Analytica, the firm that harvested the profiles, did not delete the data as promised. I mean, it makes no sense that Facebook would just take their word for it, uh, but he didn't give an explanation for this failure on Facebook's part to properly audit. Mm -hmm. Does Zuckerberg explain at all why his company didn't tell users? Um, well, no, you know, that's another question additionally is that, you know, uh, and that's a question on the mind of Facebook employees as well. Uh, yesterday, the company held a live Q&A with staff, okay, and an employee 
who told me about it was really disappointed, first of all, because Zuckerberg was not the one addressing the group. It was a, a lawyer to do it, Paul Gruwal. He's the one who wrote the original blog post about the massive data breach. Uh, and he was being lawyerly. A person asked her, hey, if we, Facebook, knew about data being wrongfully taken, wasn't it our responsibility to tell victims? Isn't it their right to know? Um, and, you know, the lawyer responded, Facebook's priorities were to investigate, to validate the claims, to handle data deletion. Basically, it was a non-answer. Uh, the person who told me about it was totally frustrated, like, come on, you know, don't give us these talking points, at least internally. Have an honest conversation about the very serious issue here. Well, conversation seems like a key word here. So statements are one thing, but has any leader at Facebook had a conversation with the public? Well, uh, Zuckerberg is scheduled to be on CNN tonight, uh, presumably for a real interview, uh, not a crafted statement. Uh, but the company has clearly discouraged other leaders from speaking, okay? In this controversy, as well as another recent controversy, two different senior employees took to Twitter to share their views, and each one ended up having to retract or apologize. Uh, what's ironic about that, of course, is that Facebook is a social network. It's not a big bank or an ExxonMobil. It's the company that built the technology that made oversharing, right? Not just sharing, but oversharing the new normal. Uh, so they want two, you know, two billion plus users to share away, but it's looking like uh, you know they want their workforce to keep quiet. Uh, not everyone at Facebook agrees with that, by the way. I've spoken with employees who feel that Facebook should be a different kind of company, more open, more transparent, given the nature of the product that they're building. Before we let you go, I think very briefly, Facebook stock shares have been on a roller coaster. Users are threatening to quit the app. Do you have any sense that these moves are going to calm things down? Well, certainly the moves are intended to calm things down, right? So much of the pressure on him to speak up is because of that financial instability around the company. Uh, but it seems like every few weeks there's a new Facebook controversy that's popping off. So I think that each new controversy gives us a different sense of what the bigger picture will end up being. But we're still in the process of understanding it. Is it a problem they can solve or is it a problem fundamental to their business model of selling people's data? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to turn to Senator Richard Blumenthal. He's a Democrat from Connecticut and a member of the Senate Judiciary and Commerce Committees, two committees that are looking into Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Senator Blumenthal, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. First, let me ask you for your reaction to Mark Zuckerberg's statement today. Did it, did it satisfy you? In no way did it satisfy me. Why not? I think that they deserve to be credited with some first steps, but they are only first steps. In effect, they're doing damage control. They're addressing the latest bad publicity and what they have done essentially is to continue with the attitude, trust us, we know better. Yes, we're selling your personal information, but we can do it without your explicit consent, even without your knowledge. So I am far from satisfied that these very vague and uh, overarching commitments will satisfy their users and consumers either. You have called on Mark Zuckerberg to take questions under oath before Congress. Are you still going to push for him to appear? It sounds like you still have lots of questions then. This very superficial mea culpa makes even more necessary his appearing before the committee. It is unspecific. He has to be questioned, perhaps under oath. Documents need to be subpoenaed. We need to know how Facebook is going to really protect privacy if it continues with the present business model of selling personal information. There is a dilemma here unless Facebook is informing people about what access there will be to that personal information and enabling them to opt out, explicitly opt out. In fact, they should be given the opportunity to decline to opt in. And this kind of consumer right ought to be the subject of questioning before a congressional committee. I think um, likely uh, the Commerce Committee where I sit. I want to zoom out a little bit um, because you're, you talk about Facebook's, uh, you know, how it has access to all this user data and a lot of what it does is and a lot of its ability or what makes it appealing to share that data. Something I'm genuinely curious about is you know, data mining and micro-targeting on social media were tools that both the Obama and Clinton campaign spent millions of dollars on. They were very proud of how technologically advanced their work was. What makes this situation with Cambridge Analytica and the Trump campaign so different from what the Clinton and Obama campaigns did? 
Well, focusing first of all on Facebook, it's under a consent decree, a 2011 order from the Federal Trade Commission to protect consumer privacy. And so uh, there is a clear need for the FTC to investigate and likely take action, and I'm going to be calling on the FTC to move forward. Second, what is different here is that Facebook bears a responsibility to safeguard privacy. It has a trust and probably a legal as well as moral obligation. That's different from a political campaign that can buy information from Facebook assuming that the users and consumers know what kind of access that campaign is going to have. Here, Cambridge Analytica apparently deliberately deceived Facebook again, unlike those campaigns which bought the information but not deceptively and said in effect it was doing nothing of the kind that eventually Facebook learned that it was doing. But then even after Facebook learned in 2015, it failed to validate or verify that in fact all of this 50 million consumer information had been eliminated. But and how that lack of due care is really an important failing here. I guess my question is what can Congress do? I mean so much of the business models of Facebook and other tech companies revolve around what they can do with user data, their ability to share user data. Can you you can't just transform those business models, can you? The business models need not be the problem. It's the rules for those business models as to how privacy is protected. Information is made available all the time to marketing firms as well as retailers and there are rules that apply to how that information is used and how products are marketed to them and the opt-out okay. and opt-in consent mechanism. So okay. I think Congress has a responsibility for making rules and overseeing them. All right. Senator Richard Blumenthal is a Democrat from Connecticut. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Mark Zuckerberg resurfaced this afternoon. The CEO of Facebook, of course, in a post on Facebook, made his first public comment since the news broke last weekend that Cambridge Analytica had scraped data from 50 million Facebook users and used it in questionable ways. we got Molly Wood, the host of Marketplace Tech, on the phone to make me smart on all this. Hey, Molly. Hey, Kai. So this was, uh, it was a longish post by Zuckerberg. He laid out a chronology and he said what the company is going to do, some investigations. Uh, what do you think is going to change now? Yeah, you know, it's very interesting because the tone of this post is essentially the tone of all of the Mark Zuckerberg sort of apology posts, if you go back through time. Um, there are some changes, and I think they're important. Fundamentally, the story is not just about how much access Facebook has to your data. It's who else has access, and that is mainly third-party applications that either you install or you do that login with Facebook thing, mm -hmm. uh, and then those apps get access to all your data. Now, in the early days, part of the way that Facebook got so big so fast is that it got all these developers onto the platform so you could play fun games and take fun quizzes, <laughs> and the way it got those developers on the platform was to give them access to an all-you-can-eat buffet of data right. about all of us. That is how Cambridge Analytica got all those profiles. Facebook restricted that access around 2014, and today Mark Zuckerberg said that he's go that, that access will be restricted even further. They'll take a look back at apps and how much data they gathered then and let people know that is likely to be horrifying, the results of that. Yeah. And uh, they will give users more obvious control over what apps can access our data. Which is no small thing because Facebook uh, privacy and security settings are notoriously buried deep in those menus. Is this going to help though? I think that that is a really open question. In Facebook's previous history, you know, this has been enough. Sort of a, a vague apology uh, and then some relatively substantive changes that don't do much to impact the business model. Mm -hmm. But I think that as this goes forward, this is the point where people are going to realize, hey, wait, this is the business model. And it always has been. And it, the extent of that will become increasingly clearer and I think that's just going to be an ongoing PR issue. Okay, but here's the deal. Data is money. And so, and so Zuckerberg is now saying, in essence, we're going to take a hit perhaps because uh, we're going to limit data. Is that what this is going to lead to? I 
find that hard to believe. Yeah. You know, I mean, that that sort. The pitch here is, you know, for example, if you haven't used an app in, in over three months, we'll turn off access right. to your data. But there's no kind of there's not a, a broad acknowledgement that this is the business model and that it, it fundamentally is going to change. And I think that it's also safe to say that, that Zuckerberg and Facebook executives are betting on a lot of people not making these changes and continuing to use Facebook the way they always have because not only is it, as many people refer, you know, say the oil of the modern economy, right. it's, it's everything. It's everything to Facebook. And increasingly, I think now we realize it's everything to all the apps that you use on Facebook as well. Right. And, and we're going to have a story from Amy Scott here in a minute about what Facebook is to businesses. But in the 30-ish or so seconds that you and I have left, do you think this is a tipping point? Do you think Zuckerberg now understands what's going on? And, and you know, it's really funny. I, as I asked that question, I realized I've asked you that question every single time <laughs> Facebook gets into exactly. trouble. Right? I mean, Exactly. Congress wants answers, the European Union wants answers, the FTC may be investigating these privacy violations. I do think uh, that this is different. I do not think Mark Zuckerberg thinks it's different. Hmm. Molly Wood is the host of Marketplace Tech, also with me of a podcast we do called uh, Make Me Smart, where uh, we talked in the most recent episode was dropped yesterday. We talked at length about this whole thing. More from Molly uh, on that uh, Make Me Smart, uh, wherever you get your podcast. Molly, thanks a lot. Thanks, Kai. So as I said, the quick answer to the whole Facebook thing for a whole lot of people is that users should just delete their accounts, right? We have seen that approach work before. Delete Uber is what I'm thinking of, which is easy when Lyft is basically the next app over, right? Just a thumb smash away. But for Facebook's two billion some odd users, there is nothing quite like it yet. Marketplace's Amy Scott has that one. Like a lot of people, Jody Marvel had been using Facebook less recently to escape the social media bubble. She's a math and economics tutor in Boise, Idaho. Then she read about Cambridge Analytica. And I was just really shocked and angry. So this morning, Marvel downloaded all of her posts and pictures and deleted her account. I want to send them a message just telling them that this is not acceptable to me. Stefan Matanovitz, a lawyer in Philadelphia, quit Facebook a month ago after advising his clients to steer clear of it. He plans to delete Facebook-owned Instagram next. Ultimately, it came down to, am I going to eat my own dog food? And the answer for me was yes. That might mean missing out on invitations or local events. Many others say Facebook is too important for their business or for staying in touch with distant relatives. Cheryl Katzen, a librarian in D.C., is torn. When Hurricane Harvey flooded Houston last summer, a message she posted on Facebook led to the rescue of her elderly parents. If most kids like that, I were, if I could kiss Mark Zuckerberg, I would have. Alessandro Acquisti studies the economics of privacy at Carnegie Mellon. He says when you delete Facebook, you're not just deleting your profile. You're also saying goodbye to all the accumulated value you derive from interacting with other people on the network. Jody Marvel, who quit Facebook this morning, hopes if enough people join her, a viable and more responsible alternative will take its place for Marketplace. Facebook shares actually bounced back a little bit today, about three quarters of a percent. Elsewise, in the wider markets, traders were of mixed minds after the Fed meeting. We will have the details when we do the numbers. All of that after the latest news. Zuckerberg, I apologize. Hello, I'm Jim Lee with BBC News. Facebook's founder, Mark Zuckerberg, has said he's sorry that his company allowed the firm Cambridge Analytica to exploit the data of 50 million Facebook users on behalf of political clients. Mr Zuckerberg told CNN he promised to review thousands of third-party apps, restricting the amount of future access to their developers. Our media editor, Amal Rajan, has more. Mark Zuckerberg was heavily criticised, not least by investors, for failing to respond quickly and publicly to the revelation that tens of millions of Facebook users had their data harvested without their knowledge. He expressed contrition and regret at the failure to inform those users that they had been affected in that way. Pledging a forensic audit of other applications that could have left users exposed, he accepted that there had been a major breach of trust. And do remember you can keep up with the programme by following BBC World Service on Facebook and Twitter. And you can text us on anything you hear, the number if you'd like to do so. Uh, to send a text you can send it to plus six six six. We 
made mistakes. Words of Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has finally broken his silence regarding this week's revelations about the alleged misuse of data, billions of Facebook users by a company called Cambridge Analytica. In a statement, he said it was Facebook's responsibility to protect its users' data. Uh, many investors have already sold off their stock. Some people have started a delete Facebook campaign. On the line now, Hannah Kushner, San Francisco correspondent for the Financial Times uh, newspaper. Um, I mean, first of all, what do you make of this uh, Zuckerberg statement? So, a lot of people have been waiting for this statement for some time. This story actually began to break last Friday night. And before, in the past, Zuckerberg has not been shy about commenting. And Facebook's already, you know, been in quite a few scandals over the last year and about Russian disinformation, fake news. And Zuckerberg has normally come out and spoken straight away. So I think there was a lot of tension about why he wasn't speaking. And now he's come out and spoken in a really big way. He's spoken on his Facebook page and he spoke to CNN, the New York Times, and Wired magazine. Um, he has had a bit of a mea culpa. He said that even though Cambridge Analytica broke Facebook's rules, um, which was perhaps what the spokespeople were stressing before, that they were outraged at how the company had treated them, he's now come back and saying, actually, it's also Facebook's responsibility to look after its users' data, and it should have done better, and it's going to try and do better in the future. Doing better in practice means what? So he laid out some specifics. So there's some of things related to the Cambridge Analytica um, incident already. So they're going to go back and tell any users that were affected by that leak. They're also going to go back and look at apps at this period. This was before they tightened their privacy policies. And they're going to um, look through thousands of apps and search and see if other apps were mishandling the data. And then going forward, they're also introducing new rules which are slightly stricter for how apps handle data what data will be shared with apps. So, for example, if you haven't bothered to use an app for three months, then it doesn't get your data anymore. I've seen one paper uh, talk about uh, a reputational crisis for Facebook. Is it that bad? I, I think it has, but I don't think this is the first episode in it. I really do think that Facebook has had a reputational crisis ever since the US election back in 2016. Um, you know, it's gone from being seen as this company that it wanted to be seen as, connecting the world, bringing, you know, internet and um, community to the rest of the world, to something that's seen as actually potentially playing quite a dangerous role, especially when it comes to democracies. I mean, Zuckerberg said today in several of his interviews that he, he could never have imagined, um, you know, when he started this company, in 2004 in his dorm room that it would become such you know, a centre for such crucial questions about democracy. It's a cutthroat world out there and there are other social media sites sort of looking back and watching things with glee and hoping to take advantage. I mean, I think there's a, every rival to Facebook has always wanted to beat Facebook. It's by far the largest site. I and mean, Facebook has over 200, 2 billion users, whereas the closest sites are in the hundreds of millions. Um, and the actual closest site is Instagram, which is owned by Facebook. Um, so I, I don't think this is going to suddenly see a dramatic shift and everyone's going to go to Snapchat or something else. Um, Twitter also has had its own fair share of problems with bots and disinformation. Um, but there is a delete Facebook campaign and um, Zuckerberg said today that while he didn't think it was going to have a meaningful impact on their figures, he saw that there was a crisis of trust. And for ordinary Facebook users, should they be worried at all? After all, a lot of them have had their data harvested. So I mean, some of this stuff is hard to put back in the bag. if if. The data was harvested and used to create profiles of people that we don't know about. Um, then it's really hard to to say, oh, let's, let's give it back. Um, Cambridge Analytica does say that it hasn't used Facebook data in the models that it uses at the moment, um, but they're going to have to take their word for it. Uh, and I think that there's also just questions about for the you know thousands of other apps and also whether people are actually paying enough attention to the settings as they are at the moment and going in and digging down you have to dig quite far still to work out what for example your friends can share about you to other apps that sounds like a big deal it sure is um i think it might be the biggest crisis facebook has faced so far um especially considering it's coming on the heels 
um, of the company dealing with the aftermath of, you know, Russian trolls uh, spreading uh, propaganda and fake ads on the site. Facebook's initial reaction seemed to be to like seemed to pose itself as a victim in the sense it was saying it was uh, deceived by the use of these so-called third-party apps, which managed to to get uh, data from more than 200,000 people, and then that sort of expanded to harvesting data from 50 million people. There's, there's a change of, of tone now from Facebook. Right. I think. Um Zuckerberg realized that he was going to have to take responsibility um, because the buck stops with him. He's the CEO. Um, and we've seen this time and again um, as Zuckerberg and Facebook have had to deal with various privacy-related uh, controversies and other controversies. Um, they tend to... They tend not to say sorry right away, you know, um, and in this case, uh, Zuckerberg was missing for a couple days while all this played out and didn't speak until, uh, you know, almost five days later. Indeed, there's even a, a, a hashtag going around on Twitter, um, hashtag where's Zuck. So he's finally come out, he's spoken on a very practical level. What is Facebook or what can Facebook do now? Right, so he, today he outlined three steps, and uh, the first of those steps is to review the apps that might have had uh, the same kind of access to, to Facebook users' friends before Facebook in 2014 made the change that, you know, people, Facebook users who use apps, um, developers could collect their information, but they shouldn't be able to collect those Facebook users' friends' information when they hadn't authorized it. So that's the first step. Uh, the second step that uh, Zuckerberg talked about today is restricting access to third-party app developers from now on, um, basically restricting the kind of informa user information they should be able to get. And then third is uh, something to, that looks to be um, an attempt to appease users, and that's more transparency, let, uh, showing them exactly uh, what information apps are collecting about them and making that more visible to them so that users feel better about, you know, using other apps on Facebook. And just a final thing, uh, briefly, how damaging is this going to be long term to the Facebook brand? Uh, it, it's hard to say. I mean, this this week, uh, Facebook lost, um, I, I believe it was almost uh, 60, and let me see what, if I can remember. Uh, I think it was, what, $60 billion in market value. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, it was a big deal because... Um, it comes as a lot of people are calling for more regulation of tech companies, and this Facebook controversy is, uh, you know, the most high-profile example of why people would be calling for more regulation of companies. So that's one thing, um, and then, and then the other thing is um, when people are suspicious of Facebook, they might start to use it less and less. And that's certainly a long-term uh, issue that the company has to worry about. Maintaining user numbers uh, create priority for Facebook. The data was reportedly harvested by a Cambridge, that's Cambridge, England, Cambridge professor, Alexander Kogan. Who is Kogan? Uh, so he is among the three uh, researchers at the Psychometrics Center at Cambridge University who developed the psychometrics technique along with Mikhail Kaczynski, who's now at Stanford, and David Stilwell, who is uh, also still at University of Cambridge. And uh, those two other uh, academics did not decide to join the company that ultimately provided SEL with the data. So let's turn to the former White House chief strategist, Steve Bannon, who worked with Cambridge Analytica. Bannon was speaking with Financial Times editor Lionel Barber. Data for Facebook is just about the cost of it. 
That debt is out there. It's a marketplace for your data. It's bought and sold every day. Yeah, but the paper it's didn't know it was being leaked. That's, 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 that's the different. That's the issue between Cambridge, the professor, and Facebook. And by the way, there's an open fact. Were, were you aware of that leak? I didn't, didn't, didn't even know about. It didn't even know about the Facebook mining. Saying, but hang on, but hang on, hang on. The point is that is Facebook's business. In 2008, it was Google and Facebook that went to Barack Obama and met him in San Francisco Airport and told him all about the power of this personal data. In 2012, and we have the we have the uh, woman who headed up Data Integrity said, "Hey, Facebook gave us the information because they were quote unquote on our side." So the great opposition party, media, never went after the Obama campaign, never went after the progressive left, as they've been doing this for years. So that is uh, President Trump's former chief strategist of Breitbart News, Cambridge Analytica. Respond to what he just said. Well, he's leaving out an important fact that Facebook did not activate the feature called custom audiences, which allows campaigns to upload voter data right into Facebook to target people individually by name until October, October 23rd, 2013, well after Obama's second campaign. So the Facebook tools to target people were simply not available during those campaigns. Well, let me go to Carol Davidson, who served as Obama's campaign director of integration and media analytics during the 2012 campaign. In this video posted online in 2015, she described how the campaign used Facebook. The Obama campaign just did this uh, on a digital, in a digital level, on a much larger, larger level, but we were actually able to ingest the entire social network, social network of the U.S. Uh, that's on Facebook, which is most pe most people. Uh, where this gets complicated is that freaks Facebook out, right? So they shut off the feature. Well, the Republicans never built an app to do that. So the data is out there. You can't take it back, right? So the Democrats have this information. Uh, so when they look at a voter file and someone comes to them, they can immediately be like, oh, here are all the other people that they know, and here are people that they can help us persuade because they're really good friends with, with this person. The Republicans do not have that information and will not get that information. So that was Carol Davidson, Obama campaign's director of integration and media analytics during the 2012 campaign, speaking in 2015. Well, on Sunday, she wrote on Twitter, quote, Facebook was surprised we were able to suck out the whole social graph, but they didn't stop us once they realized that was what we were doing. They came to office in days following election recruiting and were very candid that they allowed us to do things they wouldn't have allowed someone else to do because they were on our side. Professor Powell, Professor Carroll. Well, I mean, I think this is a wake-up call for everyone about the data that we've been leaking all over the place ever since the internet became a commercial aspect of our lives. So um, it's one thing to collect data, and it's another thing to be able to target people and target people individually. So there's a lot of complicated issues here, but I think the... Uh, this whole Cambridge Analytica crisis has uh, created a potential tipping point where we're going to have new attitudes about letting our data leak all over the place and try to recapture control of it. I want to turn to an interview Mark Zuckerberg uh, did back in 2009 with BBC. So who is going to own the Facebook content? The person who puts it there or you? The, the person who's putting the content on Facebook always owns the information, and that's why this is such an important thing, and, and why Facebook is such a special service that people feel a lot of ownership over. Right? This is their information; they own it. And you uh, they, won't sell they it. often want to. No, of course not. This is their information; they own it. Let's shift gears and talk about Facebook and the continuing fallout from the Cambridge Analytica scandal. The data analytics firm was recently outed as having used information from the profiles of about 50 million users without their knowledge. One entity who did know about it was Facebook. After days and days of silence, Facebook's co-founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg went on a media blitz Wednesday and posted a lengthy mea culpa on, of course, his Facebook page. Here he is now speaking to CNN. This was a major breach of trust, and, and I'm really sorry that this happened. Uh, you know, we have a basic responsibility to protect people's data, and if we can't do that, then, then we don't uh, deserve to have the opportunity to serve people. That's Facebook co-founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg speaking on CNN. Now, we won't go into the whole Cambridge Analytica story. We did an hour on that this week, and you can find it online at the1a.org. But, Margaret, I wonder what the latest is in terms of 
the fallout for Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Where does that stand? Well, the fallout for Facebook and for Mark Zuckerberg is, um, is a really important question because it's the confluence of a few things. Number one, technology changes so fast that the generational life cycle of who wants to use what app is not like a human generation. It's not 20 years, it's like a five-year window. Like, right, my kid's like, what, Facebook? You know, but, you know, Snapchat was hot last year. Nobody does that anymore. And there was Musical.ly and, like, now whatever. And Remember so, MySpace? Like, no, right? So, so, um, so there's there's that. And then there's also this huge issue uh, that, that, that Facebook is in the eye of the storm on now, which is our privacy in the age of social media. And Everybody's not just worried about Facebook. Everybody's worried about everything. Every time you make an online transaction, every time you use, you know, ways to get your driving directions. I mean, it's everyone assumes, right? Either way, what are we all afraid of? That it's all getting misused or manipulated somehow by who? By the Russian government? By marketers? By health insurance companies? Who knows? And so, there's a real fear about that. And then also, Mark Zuckerberg has, you know. Uh, been sort of politically polarizing. Remember when we all were wondering whether he was going to run for president and you've got a lot of everybody on the Hill is kind of scared about what kind of position they're supposed to take and how the Democrats act and how the Republicans act. So it is kind of the perfect storm of politics, of privacy fears, and of our fast-moving consumer taste in, in apps. Cheryl, let's stick with Capitol Hill for a minute because a number of lawmakers' frustration with Facebook has just kind of boiled over in the last week or so. The top Democrats on the House and Senate Intelligence Committees have called on Mark Zuckerberg to testify. Senator Richard Blumenthal said he should be subpoenaed if he won't show up by choice. And Zuckerberg, in the interview with CNN, said he would be happy to testify, quote, if it's the right thing to do, unquote. I am wondering whether or not he actually understands how important it is for him to show up. If you listen to that CNN, CNN interview, he says we a lot. We take this seriously. We're very sorry. We're taking steps. He almost never used the word I in the entire interview. Do we get the sense that Mark Zuckerberg understands how seriously Capitol Hill takes this? Well, I think if he doesn't understand it, he's going to understand it very soon because the, I frankly don't see how he can avoid uh, testifying. Some might think that he would want to send his uh, second-in-command, Sheryl Sandberg. She's very polished and, um, you know, is knowledgeable about uh, the ways of Washington. But I think Zuckerberg has to stand to account for his own company. And in some ways... I feel a teensy bit sorry for him. He said something in an interview with the New York Times that was very revealing. He said, if you would have asked me when I was sitting in my dorm room at Harvard, would I have known that I would be managing a company that is dealing with things like, you know, Russian interference in the American elections or psychographic profiles to try to manipulate the way people vote? You know, this was something that he never envisioned. And it's almost running away from him. And I think that within Facebook, they have to get a hold of this. They've got to get kind of a hold of the, the power that their company has and, you know, come to a reckoning. And then I do think he's got to show up here in Washington. It's interesting that you mentioned that in terms of the power that it has. One of the things that he also said in the CNN interview, and he made that point about sitting in the dorm in, in the CNN interview too, is about the potential need for regulation. He was asked, do you believe Facebook, you know, how do you feel about regulation? He said, maybe we should be regulated. <laughs> uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar... That's a departure. Exactly. Senator Amy Klobuchar, a Democrat from Minnesota, Democratic Senator Mark Warner of Virginia, have both introduced bills that would oversee campaign ads on the platform, which Facebook had not supported. Alexi, I wonder about the legislative atmosphere after the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal. Where does that Sure. Uh, the Honest Ads Act that you just mentioned from Klobuchar and others is something that they are really passionate about. Unfortunately, that's just one small part of it. And I think what we're starting to see with Cambridge Analytica um, and what we will see if and when he testifies is just how far-reaching and why this is. So the Honest Ads Act is a step in the right direction. Um, but I think the worst-case scenario for Facebook would be increased regulation on how they collect data and use data because their advertising sort of relies on that. Um, I'm sorry, Alexi, the Honest Ads Act, that would be to include 
more disclosure of who pays for ads. Like when you listen to a TV right. ad, I'm Joshua Johnson, I paid for this message. That right. kind of disclosure for digital ads. Right, yes. And so again, a step in the right direction. Um, but one interesting thing I think we should talk about is like how regulation toward big tech, including Facebook and others, is happening already at the state level. Um, there's a man in Maryland, in the Maryland State Legislature named Alonzo Washington, who has already put forward regulation proposals for some of these tech giants, including Facebook. And we're starting to see this state level regulation against tech happening everywhere from you know, New York to Washington, um, Maryland and California. And so I think that's something that Facebook will have to consider too when Mark Zuckerberg is saying, I will testify in front of Congress, obviously the federal level, um, if I'm the right person to do that, which he is the right person to do that. But these things are already happening at the state level and I think that's something the company will have to confront moving forward. Internet King wrote on our website, the1a.org, this Cambridge Analytica scandal is a little overblown. I still believe the media's coverage of Hillary's fake scandals and Comey's letter did more damage than the fake news that Cambridge Analytica spread through Facebook. But this scandal shows Trump's willingness to do anything to win. This will be important once Mueller's report shows connections between Trump's campaign and Russia. Mike writes, Obama mined data and was praised by the New York Times for it. Yes, Mike, that is true, but we actually had the man on who built the data analytics for the Obama campaign on 1A this week, and he explained there are some very key differences between what they did and what Cambridge Analytica did. You'll find that conversation on our website, the1a.org. And Kevin writes, Mark Zuckerberg never envisioned this? Yes, he did. How else would he have gotten the billions in funding? By the way, we asked some of the folks in the 1A text club to respond to the Facebook Cambridge Analytica story. No one likes to be broken up within a text message, but we asked if you could break up with Facebook, if you're considering it, and do it in a text, what would you write? We got some great responses. One of our listeners wrote, things have gotten creepy. It's like you're always watching me. I think we should see other people. Another one wrote, we were both younger when we met, but things were so different then. And yet another listener wrote, nothing. They'd probably sell that text message. You'll find more of our Facebook breakup texts from our amazing text club members on our Facebook feed. No, the irony. The link is facebook.com slash the 1A show. And you can join our text club by texting 1A to 666.